morning, afternoon, or evening for everybody that's watching. This will be a uh, recorded event that you can view at all different times um, and take a look uh, at on uh, panel radiators, the rest of the efficiency equation. We're going to talk about some different things from offered from the Permo Group um, for panel radiators along with QHT. Um, I'm Evan Lebeck with Dan Davis Sales. We're based out of uh, Lebanon, Maine, and we cover New England. I'm a manufacturer's rep, and I'm going to be reviewing uh, this product and its benefits and applications uh, today and for about an hour. We're going to go over a, a variety of different things about panel radiators. Um, and we'll take a look here at what we're going to go over for the overview. We're going to do an overview of some of the low temperature systems. We're going to try and understand panel radiators. We're going to look at the Pyramo panel radiator offering, talk a little bit about sizing, and we'll also talk about connecting to the radiators and piping the panel radiators. First, I want to kind of review a little bit about the companies we're going to be talking about today and have a view of who they are and, and what they do in the marketplace. So Permo Group is uh, a European-based company. It's one of the largest radiator manufacturers uh, in the world, and they make radiators across Europe, Poland, Austria, the UK. They have the ability to make 20,000 panel radiators per day. Um, Permo radiators are imported by QHT. They would be the North American importer of the panel radiators based out of Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Um, Meissen radiators and towel bars are also under the Permo Group uh, name and company, and it's one of the many companies that they own that are associated with their indoor climate comfort division, which takes a look at all of the different things, whether they're in a hydronic or fan convector market. Um, so there's a lot of, a lot of different things that are offered by the Permo Group. We're going to review quite a few of those different things today and, and discuss them. If you do have questions, I do ask that you can reach out to myself at evan at dandavissales.com. We cover the New England market um, based out of Lebanon, Maine, and we'd be happy to field any questions. You can also find QHT online along with the Permo Group. So if you do have questions, as this is a recorded event, please just feel free to reach out after at any given point and we'll try and get to the answers that we can. So we'll continue on. We'll take a look here at uh, some local inventory to us here in New England. Uh, so you'll see this is a based out of Portsmouth, New Hampshire. This is the stack of the radiators. This is the CV product um, that you're getting a view of. And basically all, all the fittings are also stocked here as well. Uh, QHT have the ability to remove radiators uh, quickly throughout New England. And so when you take a look, we're gonna talk a little bit about the market in itself, uh, go through the different things that have changed so that we can take a look at that and also have the ability to kind of figure out how we got to where we are today. Uh, Panel radiators in Europe are common practice. They've been used for a long time. The marketplace here uh, in America is continually growing, and I would say really got its start to become a more of a mainstream product in the last 10 years, uh, but it's been available in this marketplace for, for probably about 20 years or so now. So when we start talking about the market recap, we'll talk about the 1990s. Take a look here at some of the things that were going on, three pass cast iron boilers were becoming popular due to radiant heating. Uh, a lot of people were looking to do that radiant style heat at this point in that market, and they were turning to these European boilers to do so. Um, it becomes, radiant heat becomes the high end radiation. Uh, primary secondary piping is new and difficult to understand for many contractors. And natural gas at this point is used commercially, very few companies pushing propane, and very few wall-hung boilers being sold in the marketplace. <clears throat> when we take a look at the 2000s here, we have uh, wall-hung boilers becoming a little bit more popular. Baseboard is still common and retrofit. Radiant still being used, but there's some type of realization that is difficult to control, especially in the shoulder months having those conversations with homeowners about, well, you got to set your thermostat at 70 and you got to leave it there, not for days or weeks, but, but months if you want radiant to function correctly. 
rebates coming out from the gas companies, which is starting to drive wall-hung boiler sales in the 2000s, and oil companies must look at propane to compete with natural gas. Internet and rebates are playing a larger role in the homeowner's decision of what boiler gets installed. So let's take a look at kind of the recap of where we are today, right? Wall hungs are extremely popular. Cast iron boilers are being shipped with reset controls uh, due to the energy mandate uh, in 2012. So every boiler is being shipped with some type of reset. Realization that efficiencies are related to water temperatures is starting to become common knowledge amongst contractors and people in the industry. Radiators grow quickly. Uh, they're easy to install. They have quick heat up times, lower water temperatures, and extremely easy to zone. Homeowners obviously love the comfort and control of a big radiator. So why can you use low water temperatures, right? We, we look at things and I'm um, in Maine and up here our design temperature depending on where you are in the state is minus 20 to minus 30 and you look at it and say geez how can I heat with this lower water temperature right well as you see in this chart here for New England as a whole and weather data you spend a whole lot of your time in the year at that 25 to 75 degree temperature right about 80 percent of your year so you're not often at that low design point, maybe only a day or two a year, do you reach that design point of you know minus 20 or minus 30. You've sized your boiler and your radiation to handle that low, low point, right? And so having the ability to use low water temperatures is gonna drive a, a higher efficiency, but it also is allowing you most of the year, you don't need that high temperature, get high temperature water and all those BTUs that are placed in the basement for that one or two cold days of the year. Let's talk a little bit about rebate driven install trends, right? So what's driving these situations where, while there are many drivers to a heating system uh, and the choices that are made to put what in your home, rebates do play a big role. And we see here, these rebate driven systems performing to their full ability, does that sale always have to be in the basement when it comes to a new system for a homeowner will you benefit them a little bit more by maybe upgrading their radiation to match up with lower temperatures we'll talk about that a little bit um, it looks like here you can see for a natural gas uh, hot water boiler with an efficiency of 95 or greater or posted efficiency you know that's a large rebate in the state of massachusetts so you see rebates like this around and, and they drive what the homeowner is gonna choose and, and put into their home. So let's take a look at um, wall hung boilers. Let's talk a little bit about them. There's a lot of these installed and put out in the field. Um, and of course, we named this presentation uh, panel radiators and, and the efficiency equation, right? They kind of solved that efficiency equation. And so it's an interesting piece. So this ties right into that. Uh, wall hung boiler ratings, um, basically, when you look at wallungs rated through AHRI for normal efficiency testing, they're testing them at 140 degree supply water temperature and 120 degree return water temperature. They may also be testing these in facilities or boiler boxes, as they call them, with controlled humidity and controlled temperature to maximize that efficiency rating that's put on that energy guide sticker that you see there. The testing is what the boiler literature indicates their efficiency is, but is that how your system actually runs? Let's take a look at some of these rebate driven boiler installs, right? And let's talk about how you, you maximize efficiency. This, this chart here is, is really just gonna show you what happens when you're delivering different temperatures uh, to the boiler return side, right? So when you're returning return water temperatures, at these temperatures, here's really what your efficiency is going to be. And when you see the three plotted lines, it's very simple. Just to, I know that some boilers today have 10 to 1 turndowns and some 5 to 1 turndowns. This, just to make the chart simple to understand, really only shows three modulation points, 25, 50, and 100%. And if you follow that line and you see the circle there, you are in a situation where I refer to this as the intersection of efficiency, right? At 140 degrees or higher, 150, 160, 170, 180, 
on your return water temperature, you, you start to stop condensing in that product and your efficiencies greatly drop, right? So you can see that your line lines up, depending on your modulation point, anywhere really between 86 and 88%. So when you take a look at that, you always want to drive to make sure that those return water temperatures are below that 140 degrees. And as you get lower on your return water temperatures, you start to see that increased in, increased efficiency. So I always refer to uh, that 140 on the return water side being a key, key piece, and it's the intersection of efficiency. You always want to get that posted efficiency. Let's talk about some of the ways that you could achieve that opposed efficiency with low water temperatures. Radiant heat would be one of them. Uh, it's a low water temperature system, 110 to 150 degrees roughly, right? It's a comfort heat. Many people speak highly of the comfort of radiant heat. You can use warm board or a light concrete pour, lightweight concrete pour, staple up with aluminum plates. There are insulation requirements depending on the type of the system. It's complex to zone and install. Let's take a look at baseboard heat. What if you were to provide those types of low water temperatures, which we may do on a light basis with reset now, but what if you were to consistently apply these temperatures to something like baseboard, right? We take a look at it and it's really hard to get the heat output out of baseboard when you start providing that 140 or 130 or 120 degrees to baseboard, you really limit yourself to the BTUs that you put out take a look at 130 per se, you're getting 260 BTUs per foot compared to 580 at 180 degrees. It's about a 50% reduction, right? So you're not gonna be able to get or have enough wall space to put out all the heat at a low temperature with standard baseboard, right? So they have, baseboard has come up with, with a product called referred to as low temp baseboard. Some of them have dual convectors depending on the scenario to get to those lower temperatures to try and maximize that efficiency. If you look here, is there really enough wall space at 130 and four gallons a minute? You're in a little bit of a better scenario where you get 411 BTUs per foot uh, opposed to that 260. So you get a little bit more of a higher output there, but you still need a lot of baseboard along that wall to make sure that you can still produce heat at that lower temperature to achieve your efficiency. So let's talk about panel radiators. The right radiation equals the right efficiency, right? Lower design water temps, right? So you can go from 110 to 180 degrees. You get your every room zoning capabilities, uh, which is inexpensive to do with panel radiators. You can shut down a room while not using it, creating less space to heat. Quick heat up times, um, for setback thermostats, unlike radiant, where you really want to just keep that keep that temperature in the room at the same for a long period of time. Lower water temps, right, is the best way to save energy. We've already talked about that quite a bit, but getting getting south of that 140 and allowing your boiler to condense is going to create just much more efficiency for the homeowners. Allows condensing boilers to be their most efficient, but you can also use these with non-condensing systems, right? They're more efficient due to their ability to run low water temperatures. You don't want to condense in those systems, obviously, but if you keep your temperatures at 140, 150, and you're able to heat the home that way, you're going to save some money just not having to burn that energy to get to those higher temperatures as well. Let's talk a little bit about some panel radiator basics. We've talked about the market a little bit. We've talked about why lower water temperatures are important and how they play a role in the efficiency of the boiler. It's not just about the boiler and it posting 96%, but those low water temperatures are important. Let's get to some of the basics on panel radiators. We talked about the basics here. You'll see kind of a layout. When we refer to panel radiators, there's different types of panel radiators, not just different brands and different looks to radiators, but within that brand or style of radiator, whether it be a CV or, or an RCV, there are different types, right? So when we refer to type 11, we talk about single water jacket and single convector. These are design style radiators that you'll see out there um, that are type 11 radiators. We'll, we'll talk about those a little bit later. You have type 21. So what you'll see is when we talk about the types, we always have 
refer to convectors and water jackets, right? So an 11, one convector, one water jacket. A 21 is going to have two water jackets, but one convector in the center. It's a decently popular radiator in the marketplace for some other brands. For us, the 22 is the mainstay. Good heat output uh, in a small space, a four inch width, right? Not a giant looking radiator, but you have two water jackets and two convectors, right? Then you see some type 20, type 33s, excuse me, out there with a triple water jacket and triple convector. And this is gonna really maximize heat output and, and kind of power pack that uh, when you're on a smaller space in the wall and have the ability to give you more BTUs. But this is how we would refer to radiators. Again, the 22 is the largest uh, largest seller for us, what we move most of um, in, in the panel radiator market. So how does a panel radiator work, right? Uh, Permal radiators have multiple connection methods. There's different ways to do it. The preferred method is using the supply and return from the bottom of the radiator. This is just going to allow things to function much, much easier. It's not the only way to do it, but it also allows the use of a non-electric thermostatic valve as well. So you can have your, your control of temperature up there by the radiator, which makes it very simple to zone each room or each radiator if you like. Um, the supply of the radiator is always on the inside of the radiator. So you just want to be aware of that. If you do happen to pipe these opposite where you put the supply to the return and the return to the supply, you will get a light harmonic in the radiator and you'll know instantly that they're backwards. Um, those harmonics are created because of the reverse connection. Water flow from the bottom of the supply goes directly to the top of the radiator, as you can see in the red line here. And if the TRV is used, it determines whether it should continue to allow water to flow through it or not. Do I need heat or don't I need heat, right? So, and the TRV stands for thermostatic radiator valve. So how does it connect to a radiator? Very simple, you'll see in the picture in the top right here, where you see a brass element that's inside there, that'll be on the radiator and then you will thread in uh, that, there'll be a white cap there that you remove to get to that brass and then you'll thread in your, um, your thermostatic radiator valve. And that allows you to thread onto that brass piece where you see the plunger, which is gonna either open or close the valve depending on the temperature of the radiator. You can do this on a live system as well. So how does a TRV work, right? I don't wanna to get too far in the weeds with this, but, but expansion and contraction of the liquid along with the set point of the actuator moves the valve stem to either push it open and allow internal radiator valve to open or close, right? You're just gonna push it open or close it, right? So like three, for example, on the TRV is 68 degrees Fahrenheit. And if that temperature is below that, and we're gonna say, okay, we need to open a little bit and allow some water to flow through this radiator so we can heat the room. If we're above that, we're gonna to decide to leave that closed because the room is at the set temperature that it needs to be. So this just gives you a view of the internal of a thermostatic radiator valve. We do install the brass piece in the internal part of that on each of our radiators at the factory. So it'll have a white cap on it like we showed in the prior slide. So let's talk about heat up times, right? Most panel radiators meet their steady state temperature within four minutes. It's a quick, quick heat up time. Here's some thermal imaging here of panel radiators that you see down on the bottom. And you can kind of see where you have that heat up time and then that uniform heat up time across the radiator to the far right, where you're really transferring energy. And uh, the hot water just starts at the TRV, where you can see in this visual, and then just works its way all the way across that radiator to have uniform heat. But really quick heat up times with radiators, which allows you to not have to worry about setback thermostats and things like that. Comfort, right? Great combination of features to give a high level of comfort. Fast heat up times, up to 75% radiant heating and 25% convective. So you get this feeling of radiant heat from panel radiators and convection heat like baseboard. And you really have the ability to easily, easily control the temperature. Because of the fast heat up and cool times of a radiator, you're not overheating a space or underheating a space and constantly coming on and off, and you have really easy ability to control it. You do get a lot of questions about the thermostatic valves, and because they're so close to the radiator, 
do they really sense the correct temperature? And in the cases that I have, I've had panel radiators in my home, I have them in our office building. And I will tell you that when you have a, a wall thermostat or temperature piece near it, even though it may not be functioning, you're always within a degree or two of that setting. They're pretty accurate, even though they're on the side of the radiator. So let's talk a little bit about product codes, right? And, and what do they mean when you go to, to order a product and take a look at it, you will see that you have these product codes. And we talked about the types of, of radiators in the prior slide. It's really, really simple. If you're gonna have an eco style radiator, your part number may be ECS 12, which would be the height of your radiator. 16 would be your length. The 22 is your type. And the CV is going to give you the designation of what kind of radiator it is, a compact vental, which gives you that raised panel style look. So this just kind of gives you a breakdown of what a code would look like. There is a meaning behind these numbers. We didn't just throw a bunch of numbers out there. Just a good thing to know, right? Let's talk about, you know, water content, some different sizes with eco style CVs and and, and how they exist. Panel radiators come in all shapes, sizes, and forms, and you can often get to the ends of the means uh, in, in many different ways, depending on the space that you have. So in, in a lot of cases, if you were looking for 5,000 BTUs per se for a room, you start to go down and say, geez, I can do that with an eight inch tall radiator by 92 uh, inches long. Well, that's, that's a decent size radiator, right? And that would be at 180 degree output. So you say, okay, what else can I use? Well, if I want that 5,000, I could use a 20 by 32, or I could use a, um, a 24 by 32 or 24 by 24. A lot of different options when it comes to what you can do with radiators, depending on what the space gives you and everything else. I want to make note here that you'll see our charts always give you what our output is at a supply temperature of 180 or 140, depending on how you're sizing the radiator. So you can see what BTUs these radiators put out at these different water temperatures. We do have correction factor, factors that we'll touch upon a little bit later uh, if you have a different supply and return temperature. You can see that the water content, as this is important to system efficiency, is really not that great when it comes to panel radiators. Low water content, you know, as low as you know, a half a gallon to the biggest radiator that we have at 3.9 gallons of, of total water content. So there is not a ton of water content here, which is a good thing for system mass, which allows you to heat things up very quickly. So just a note that we'll take there. So let's talk about kind of the, the offering that's uh, available. And we'll go through these kind of piece by piece. This is not the only offering that is available, but these give you some of the mainstays. Um, eco style CV, a lot of you see these, I refer to them as raised panel style panel radiators, uh, which is the current market leader that you see on the left. Some new items to this space are the eco style RCV. And what's really neat about that product is that it has a design look to it. It's still that four inch thickness like the CV, but has a really design look. It's priced in the middle somewhere and uh, it gives you a ton of BTU output with a ton of good looks. It's just a great product that uh, is not really offered anywhere else besides from the Permo Group. Your Narbonne style radiators that you see here, we refer to these as tube style, designer style radiators, commonly a type 11, so one water jacket uh, and one convector on the inside, really give you a sleek high-end design look to match up with somebody who's maybe used a rental or something along those lines. Uh, they can be used in, in bathrooms, industrial situations, ski mountains or ski resorts rather, uh, all those types of things. We also offer standard white towel warmers along with chrome options and all different kinds of towel warmers from the Mycin side. So we do offer that as well. Just, just a, a lot of good options to choose from where for years the only offering in this space was the CV panel. So you have some more options for your customers at this point as well. I'm going to kind of run down each one of the offerings so you can take a look at it. Um, Eco style CV would be your uh, would be your main offering here. That is the current market leader. Ten year warranty, great heat output with that Type 22 style radiator, four inches off the wall, 
um, gives you really your best bang for your buck, right? Uh, economical panel radius, great heat output to size ratio. Uh, you can see that here where you have some of the some of the, the view of what you're going to get for output from 180 to 140, like we saw in the prior slide. Um, this is the RCV that we had talked about, new to the market, it's been out for about a year or so. We've done pretty well with this radiator. It's an upsell to your standard ray style panel radiator, really kind of the same bones of an eco style CV with that nice design or line look um, on the front of the panel radiator. These are, are great. Not, they're non-reversible, so they, they get put on the wall the way that they are, unlike the CV. Uh, but great-looking radiator. You can use the, the non-electric thermostatics with them. Great output to size as well. And, and they can be put in residential, commercial, institutional applications. Very versatile. 10-year uh, warranty on this as well. You see back here, your heat outputs are going to match up very similar to the CV due to the fact that the internals and the, their Type 22 radiator they have that similar output, but give that great design look, right? This is the PCV. Um, you didn't see this in the other snapshot. This is new to the market. It's it's an upsell to eco style like the RCV. But basically, instead of having the lines on the front like the RCV, this has just got that sleek, flat look that can be placed in probably more modern homes and things like that where you have no lines and it gives a nice, clean look. Also easy to clean as well as there's no dipples or surfaces to the piece of the of the radiator. Again, with this, you have the bones of the standard raised panel, so you have great heat output to size ratio. Uh, it can be installed in residential, commercial, institutional applications, and it's got, it's got a 10-year warranty as well. This is some of the heat outputs on PCV radiators. Again, very similar to what you've seen in the past couple slides. Let's take a look at the uh, the Narbonne. This is really your high-end tube-style radiator, um, real designer look, chic-looking radiator, very thin off the wall because of the Type 11 style. So you know you look at something more like two and a half inches, a little little less than that, two and a half or so uh, off the wall compared to you know maybe four inches with the other style. So real sleek look here. Um, you know, only designer radiator available with bottom connections like a standard panel radiator. Most other designer radiators are in one side and out the other. This gives you a nice fit finish if you're coming out of the wall or up through the floor. Uh, this would be direct competition to Runtel. It's got that similar look and can match up in those places. Uh, it's installed in high-end residential, commercial, and institutional applications. I often refer to this as elegant heat uh, with a 10-year warranty. You'll notice that you see a black radiator in this picture. We do have the ability to paint radiators to colors, uh, custom offering. There is a, obviously an added cost to that, but we do have that ability to do that as well. Uh, so if a customer wants a specific color, we can certainly do that. Here's some heat outputs. You're gonna notice some differences with Narbonne radiators. Your heat output isn't as great in the same space given on that size of radiator due to it being a type 11 and more sleek design look style radiator. So you'll probably need a little bit more wall space when you come to this style radiator, depending on how much BTUs you need to put out for the room. But because of that sleek design style, um, you don't get as quite as much heat output as you would with the type 22s in your uh, eco style CV or RCV or PCV style. But certainly this is a sharp looking radiator on the wall. Contact is another option, very similar to the Narbonne, uh, that gives you that end-to-end -end connection if you weren't looking for that bottom connection. And these are designer tube radiators, very similar looking. Um, again, this would be your elegant heat with a 10-year warranty. Very similar to the Narbonne product, just no ability to connect in the bottom uh, of the radiator like the Narbonne. Heat outputs are gonna fall in that same range. You will notice that you can, uh, these radiators, both in Narbonne and Contact, can be done in a um, vertical fashion. So a 79 inch tall radiator that's maybe only 14 inches wide, but gives you right up the wall space, unique look, and, and can kind of maximize that space to heat output as well, with it being a type 11 radiator. We do offer some accessories for this type of radiator, uh, whether it be a slip or a splice pipe cover, so that you can hide your pipes if you're going radiator to radiator. An inside corner is also available. 
and you can see it attached to a radiator to kind of give you that feel when you have these two bar radiators and you're doing more of a, a baseboard looking kind of style system with high-end radiators so we do offer these as well from Narbonne and Contact. We also offer fan convectors through Vito, and I think it's important, um, Permo offers it with the name Vito. This is a, a unique product with a temperature control uh, on top that allows you to do high or low temperatures with the assist of a fan. They're very, very quiet and modern looking. Uh, you can utilize them two pipe for heat only or four pipe for heating and cooling. So you see here, this gives you a little bit more of a view of that Vito radiator and you have your uh, control panel up top, which allows it to be its thermostat. Um, the whole cover slides right off for easy service. Uh, just a great product. I actually have one of these in my house and in my room above the garage, and we just love it. Uh, quick heat up, you get a ton of BTUs out of these compared to the space that's put on them, and they're quiet, and they give you a nice, nice feel to the heat. Um, you can see some of the BTU outputs uh, that you can get. There is different fan speeds, and basically the fan is going to start when it gets to see um, the temperature that's coming to the radiator so whether a zone valve opened or something along starts sending the hot water to the radiator due to the call that fan's going to kick on and start and uh, it's got some different levels to it for fan speed but you can see you can on a, on a 24 by 48 you know any on 180 degrees you can get 13,000 to 26,000 BTUs depending on what fan speed you're on at 180 and really you go from 8,000 to 16,000 at 140. So this really maximizes your ability even at lower water temperatures to kick out a bunch of heat in a small space, a nice modern looking situation. So it's just a great, great thing. Um, you'll start to see more of these fan assist style radiators where you utilize them uh, and, and have them in a quiet space but maximize your output at lower temperatures uh, with a little bit of an assist of a fan, right? So let's take a look at, you know, what do we do? We've talked about now kind of lower water temperatures. We've talked about the different style of panel radiators that are out in the marketplace. We've talked about um, the offering of panel radiators. But let's talk a little bit about what you do if you're if you're planning for a job, right? How do you go about getting panel radiators as as part of your job and and what do you do? We really break this out into two categories under new construction or retrofit markets, right? And and really what we what what we want to know is what what is my room by room heat loss? This is going to allow you to look at a room and say, okay, I've got a 5,000 BTU heat loss in this given room. I think I want to heat it with one radiator or two radiators, and and this is I'm going to you know drive 140 degree water to it or 180 degree water. What do I need for sizes of radiators, right? So you really got to know what your room by room heat loss is. Your window height is important because you can't put a 36 inch radiator if you have a window there that uh, the sill is at a, at a 24 inch height or 16 inch height, depending on how the house is laid out, right? So you need to know what your window height will be and, and are you going to go under that window? Uh, what radiator does the homeowner like? We just went through the offerings. Do they like that design style radiator? Are they more in line with the standard CV or, or the RCV, right? And how will the homeowner want to control the radiators? Do they, do they want to have a thermostat that runs one or two or three rooms combined? Do they want to have individual zoning for each room, right? This is going to help you. And should this be a high temp system or not, right? We talked about why low water temperatures are important, but in this case, are you going to be providing a boiler that's going to give 180 degrees? And you just have to take that into consideration when you size your radiators at the given temperature. Your thermostat locations, and then can I put blocking in the wall for mounting, right? If you're doing a new job, you have that ability to put that blocking in the back to make it really easy to know you're gonna find a surface on the other side, right? Are my pipes gonna come through the floor wall, right? These are all things that you just wanna take into consideration in new construction. We start to talk about retrofit. What is my room by room heat loss? Same question in retrofit, right? Or does the system heat fine currently? Measure the baseboard. Know what your connected load is if you're in a radi if you're in a retrofit application. Again, what's my window height? Am I gonna go underneath it? I need to make sure that I have my six inches off the floor along with my radiator size. So am I gonna fit under that window if I'm going there? And what's the height of my window? 
what style radiator does the homeowner like? Same question, right? Figure out what they like and what they may want in their home. Do I need to get more pipes to the second floor? Can I use existing piping? Second floor is always going to be the challenge. When you're trying to go up through, if you don't have a chase way or is there existing piping there, what's your ability to do so? How will the homeowner want to control the radiators? Again, same question. Are they going to do zoning and tying a room or two or three together? Or if they want each individual room zoned, in that case, they'll use non-electrics. Should this be a high temp system or not, right? Is it in the best benefit of the homeowner to have a lower temperature system? Certainly, if you're putting a condensing boiler, it is. Where are your thermostat locations going to be? Will my pipes come through the floor or the wall? Very similar questions, a couple different changes here, right? Let's talk about high temp or low temp. Really, what, what does this mean? What, what type of boiler is there? Is there radiant or other low temp heat emitters in the home already? What efficiency does the homeowner expect, right? If the homeowner is paying you to install a boiler, they got rebated on a boiler that's 95 plus, they're probably expecting to achieve those efficiencies. These homeowners are gonna make probably the third or fourth large investment of their largest investment of their life. They usually buy a home, have their kids college, buy a car, and then the heating system falls somewhere in that line of one of their largest expenses. So what did they expect? Do I have room for all, for all low temp radius? Can I find the room? Is there room for the radius? Can I can my outdoor reset accomplish both of those things, right? So let's take a look and find out if you're high temp or low temp, right? We consider high temp systems up to 180 degrees. This is pretty simple. It requires less or smaller radiators on the job because your your water temperature is higher and you have much more output out of that radiator at 180 degrees. It may not allow any condense. Uh, you may not allow a condensing boiler to actually enter condensing mode as often. The homeowner won't get the posted efficiency of the condensing boiler all of the time. So it's potentially easier to pipe if other high temp radiation is used. You don't have to break off another side for low temp radiation. It saves space and it may be easier to accomplish, accomplish install, especially in a retrofit job. Homeowner may be concerned of surface temperature when you provide 180 degrees, you should have that conversation with them. It's not going to burn a child if they put their hand next to it or anything along those lines, but you will feel that heat when you lean up against it. Low temperature systems we refer to as 140 degrees or less, right? This is where the wall hung boiler is gonna finally achieve its, its efficiency that it's designed for and then it posts, right? It's a, it's a great design for integrating radiant systems with panel radiators. You kind of have the best of both worlds if you're doing panel radiators and panel radiators. Quick heat up time and the shoulder months of the panel radiator is still that same kind of feel. And then also the radiant is going to give you maybe that floor warming possibility there if you're doing it, combining it, or, or using it as your heat side for the rest of the year. Possibly setting uh, the high limit on the condensing boiler at 140 degrees makes sense if you have a true full low temp system. You may eliminate concerns of the homeowner with the radiator running at cooler temperatures for children. Higher cost of radiators due to the sizes having to go up. There's a little more piping uh, if other high temp zones are used. You'll have to figure that out a little bit. Let's talk about hybrid systems, right? So these systems function between that 130 and 180. And panel radiators in this case are sized to the 180 degree level because you can get there, but they're relying on the boiler reset control uh, to kind of control the temperature of the system. There's a lot of systems out there like this. It gives you smaller radiators with the ability to condense in the shoulder months, but the boiler won't uh, enter condensing mode when the reset curve is above 150 or 160. So this is a situation where you're not going to fully be condensing all the time, but you do have that ability to get there due to outdoor reset and lower water temperatures. Setting back thermostats in this case may take the house longer to heat up. Remember, you size the radiation to that 180 degrees. All boilers coming standard with these controls. It's just utilizing them correctly. We talked a little bit earlier about, well, what if I'm, the, the literature shows you 140 degrees or 180 degree output? What if I'm doing something different? How do I know how to size your panel radiator? These are the correction factors for the panel radiators and your designed room temperature along with what you decide you'd like to have for a supply and return temperature with what we refer to as a correction factor. So you would take that correction factor and you would apply that to the BTU output 
at 180 degrees. And if you were going to supply 130 degree water and come back at 110 and you want your house to be at a, at a 68 degree situation, you are probably going to end up with a, you know, right around a 0.53, um, excuse me, 0.51 correction factor. So about 50% output of that panel radiator in that scenario, uh, but much lower temperatures and guaranteed condensing, which is going to increase your efficiencies. Well, we've talked about radiators and kind of planning for the job and, and what type of systems exist out there along with why low water temperature systems are important. But we're also going to talk about wall brackets and how to mount these things, right? When you take a look at panel radiators, you know, you always want to try and find a stud. If you're, if you're in that situation, these radiators have some weight to them. You want to make sure that you have your brackets um, placed in a stud or using some type of wall anchor. We'll, we'll talk about that. But if you're doing new construction, blocking walls just makes all the sense in the world and it makes it easier. Brackets have the ability to slide across the entire radiator. It gives you some flexibility. You don't have to be 100% precise where those brackets line up. When using valves on the bottom, this makes it very easy to remove the radiator. Why valves? Well, you can shut off, take the radiator off the wall and paint behind it if you're changing a room or anything like that. Easy to clean also. Recommended to keep the radiator four to six inches off the floor. Remember, there is a convection aspect to this product and you wanna be able to have some of that airflow that comes up across. Can't find a stud? You know, we might be able to help you with that. Take a look here where you have these toggle bolts. I've used these personally. I think they're great. Um, they're on a piece, uh, a zip tie basically in a toggle bolt. And as you drill your hole through, half inch hole through the wall, put your toggle through, you push that right tight to the wall where the, where the zip tie is that holds your toggle on the other side and you can snap off the zip tie and go ahead and put your screw in there to put the toggle tight. What's great about this is the zip tie allows you to secure it against the wall without the bolt, so they're reusable. You can take the radiator off the wall and that toggle still stays there instead of falling in the bottom of the wall. Once secured, use the bolt to tighten the bracket and hang the radiator. These are great. <clears throat> you can find them at a, at a local Home Depot or Lowe's or something along those lines. Wholesalers carry these now also. It's a great option to have. And you get a, quite a bit of hold weight uh, in sheetrock, you know, on half inch drywall, you're looking at 265 pounds, so kind of a neat way. So we talked a little bit about mounting the radiator with the brackets and making sure you find a stud. If you don't, using the correct style toggle bolt is important if you're in that sheetrock. There is some weight to these radiators. Let's talk about connecting the radiators. The CV style radiator is a reversible radiator, while the designer styles aren't but this radiator can have connections on the left or right side, depending on how you reverse the radiator. The, radi the supply connection is on the bottom uh, and is the inside connection to the radiator. If the thermoelectric valve is being used, the radiator must be piped from the bottom. You have that dip tube that comes up to the thermostatic and that only happens if you're connected to the bottom. All radiators come with a valve for non-electric connection installed and the actual non-electric valve does not need to be ordered. So let's take a look. Here's some basics when it comes to, to your fitting guide and your selection. We offer an array of different types of, of products here on your, uh, on your valves or direct connections or whatnot. In series piping, you really can't have any more than three radiators in one loop. And you really ought to think about using our diverter valves in this case. Those diverter valves are gonna be adjustable bypass valves that are gonna send 30 to 50% flow right by that radiator to the next piece of baseboard or radiator in series so that you don't have the loss of BTUs through the radiator in a lower temperature to that, that baseboard down the line of that panel radiator. Diverting valves are, are important if you're gonna be doing some series piping. A lot of people choose to do monoflow uh, T-piping. You wanna make sure that your supply and return T's <clears throat> are at least 12 inches apart right you can use a thermostatic control for this application um, along with the one above um, and for individual radi uh, individual radiator adjustment excuse me um, probably the growing in popularity and, and very popular in, in retrofit and new install is uh, your manifold style piping right so when you have your manifold style piping you refer to this as a home run system single supply and return to each radiator back to a radiant manifold 
making life very, very easy. Obviously, non-electrics can be used for this. Don't really need an isolation valve on the bottom of the radiator in this situation because you'll have the isolations at the manifold. So you'll have direct connections to that radiator uh, in the form of Eurochronos and then a compression nut fitting system to get you back over to whatever you may be using, whether it's PEX, copper, um, in that situation. These are your connection fittings, right? Diverter valves we talked about, and we have a set of isolation valves. These can be straight or angled on both of these style, va style valves. So if you're coming out of the wall, you'll use an angle. Through the floor, you'll use a straight. Um, your thermostatic control as well. Tile bar valves are a little bit different. Okay, so you have a single location as they're spread apart. So you have a, a, a location on the left and the right. So you'll have single valves in that scenario. Um, pipe connections, when you start referring to coming off the radiator or the valve, you really have your choice of 3 8 half or 5 8 PEX compression and half inch copper compression or copper sweat, depending on your scenario with your direct connection fittings. These are referred to as your chronos. These are the connections that go directly in the bottom of the radiator. You want to make sure that you, you utilize these as it's going to transfer you over from that thread style to the thread style that we use here. These are included in whatever fitting connection kit you get. So whatever you buy for PEX Copper Sweat, you'll have those in the bag with them. This here shows an example of a panel style radiator with, with a connection with your chronos. So you can see your Eurochronos is connected in the valve picture uh, up top, right into the radiator directly. And then that union nut is a uh, thread on them for the valve set, uh, set of angle valves on this one, for example. And then that union nut is threaded onto that tail end of the Eurochronos fitting. Um, tubular style radiators, you, you won't need the Eurochronos. They're already installed in that radiator and ready to go. So you'll directly connect either with your copper PEX compression on the other side or your valve. Uh, direct piping to the radiator, no valves. In this scenario, uh, there's multiple options here where there's fitting kits to PEX or half inch copper and compressor or copper fittings. This is just a direct connect scenario. Looks a lot like the picture you see here above. Um, you see the bag that you get on the left and then this is what's in the bag that gives you that direct connection right to the radiator. Uh, radiator fittings kit with copper sweat. Here's a direct connect with a copper sweat situation with the union nut leaving you that tailpiece on the other side and a fiber washer in the center. All these fittings are supplied by Kalefi. I uh, just wanted to mention that we also do represent Kalefi um, so it allows us to be able to help you with the fittings and the fittings are also um, distributed on the radiator side by QHT. Here's a copper compression fitting set, so you get a look to see what that looks like. A couple of rings there. All right, panel radiator connection with valves. You have your isolation valves, often in straighter angle, like we spoke about. The ability to shut off is great, and all valves come with the radiator uh, adapters right now. Here's your diverting valves. We talked a little bit about these. Having that ability to send that flow across to the next radiator at the given temperature that it arrived at is a great benefit and great use in series piping. This allows you to make sure that you get your advertised output out of that radiator. The non-electric thermostatic we talked about. Um, I think the biggest questions with the non-electric thermostatic is really, you know, what do the numbers mean? on that actual non-electric thermostatic. And I want you to just take a look here and you can see that on this actual piece here, your setting of zero, one, two, or three, or four, really you're gonna be two, three, and four, 60, 68, and 75. And obviously you can set to the digits in between, which fill in those gaps for you, the little dots that you see there, and they're pretty accurate. So somebody can adjust their radiator to whatever they would like to have for that given temperature. Um, I will tell you that they are lockable as well. So if you are in a commercial application and somebody wants to keep the temperature at a certain space, then you can lock them as well. Baseboard piping, right? Let's take a look at what you see here with standard baseboard piping. 80% of the, the current hydronic systems are baseboard. You can see that they're a little bit harder to zone. Um, 
they're inefficient at lower water temperatures. We talked about that a little bit earlier, highly dependent on wall space, right? They're not really aesthetically pleasing and they work well for, for they do work well for a long time, right? Kind of lacks comfort. You get this one zone room at the end, will probably feel at the end of that zone will feel cool, colder. It's a simple install though, right? So you can see the piping here. Really, we have series baseboard piping, very common system that's out there. Now you see some multi-zone baseboard systems with pumps, right? The homeowners, uh, multiple zones for the homeowners coverage usually, you know, with baseboard pumps are costly, a little more labor intensive to install than zone valves. You get some 120 volt wiring, and you require some flanges. You get some higher costs to run this electrically as well. Uh, and it's hard enough to get heat out of baseboard at lower temps to maximize that boiler efficiency. Concerns are greater when you over pump a wall on a boiler, not the same for a cast iron boiler, right? So here's a standy, standard multi-zone with zone valves. See here, this is a couple zone valves, mostly low voltage wiring, make it a little bit more simple. Uh, installs are used with relay boards, uh, multiple thermostats. There's an increased cost here, but um, usually baseboard style system with no ability to heat with condensing temperatures below 140. ECM pumps are being used more now. It's the downside of one pump. Some people see that to be there, right? Here's some radiant heat piping. Let's just take a look at it. Just a lot more complex than what you just saw in the last pieces, right? It's not as easy to install. It's labor intensive. There's a higher level of controls needed. Great comfort out of radiant. Low temperatures for great boiler efficiency. There's a learning curve for a homeowner to run this system and do it correctly. Let's take a look at piping radiators. Talked about the other options that exist out there now that you may have done or been familiar with. But panel radiators are a pretty simple situation. You review your different piping methods, the benefits of radiator piping and efficiency for boilers in the system, right? But radius can be used with many different arrangements. Must it must much easier to install than, than radiant heating, really easy to zone, and potentially less wiring to a system. PEX tubing is really the most commonly piece used to pipe these products. When you take a look here, we'll look at the series piping, right? Here's a situation where you have your max of three radiators in one loop, very similar to what you saw in your baseboard application. Uh, this can be easier with multiple radiators in a room that are closely spaced. You are limited to about 15,000 BTUs on half inch packs being used, right? So you can't, can't pipe a whole entire first floor with this if your loss is greater than that. Must use diverting valves if you want to use the TRV valves, you've got to have those there. Possibility of saving some time or manifold costs if you can put multiple radiators on a single loop or manifold. It's used often when specific rooms are not heating well. So in applications where maybe that room never hit, heated well, a panel radiator can solve that problem and still be put in series with baseboard. Monoflow T piping, um, really utilized in a lot of retrofit applications. It's harder to bleed air out of this system and your T's must be 12 inch apart, but monoflow T should be on the, on the return side. TRVs can be used when piped from the bottom connections to the radiator and depending on the valving of the system, it may be harder to isolate individual radiators. Lots of cast iron radiators and homes pipe this way, making it for a nice possible retrofit from cast iron steel panel radiators. Home run piping, right? This is where things get really simple, you get the cost of the manifold, but it's pretty quick and it allows you to have really nice control of comfort. Easier to purge radiators individually, easier to control depending on zoning. And this is great for new construction, maybe harder in two-story retrofit homes, but less of a concern about sizing pipe the radiator and less running multiple radiators off one loop of manifold. Half inch PEX rule of thumb output is 15,000 BTUs. Uh, and manifolds can be more costly than reverse return piping or monopore systems. Very easy to incorporate towel bars as well. The picture on the right is actually our office building where there's 24 panel radiators sitting in, in our office building and we, we home run each one of them individually. So now here's another home run example, kind of giving you the full blown up view here of, of your boiler, whether it's a non-condensing or condensing, this piping diagram could look very similar. Um, but this allows you to have your home run system with your panel radiators and all set at uh, running low water temperatures and the TRVs can be set at different temperatures. So I'll tell you that one of the important pieces to this is really 
what we do here in, in our space is that we, we really don't even have a thermostat in the building and we allow all of the non-electric um, thermostatic radiator valves to control the temperature in each individual space. And it allows us to do that. And what calls the boiler on is really what we call an amperage sensing relay, which knows when that pump is running at a certain amperage rate that a, a, a uh, radiator valve is open and is going to fire the boiler based on that. So we really have no thermostats in this building, uh, one single pump and 24 radiators. Very, very simple system, very easy to do. It's a 4,000 square foot space and it just makes life really, really easy. So you can get very simple with these systems and reduce some of the other things that you have in them as well. And you have in a standard system with thermostats, relay boards, and all those different types of things. So let's take a look um, at uh, at panel radiator, you know, sales end of it. You know, are you are your customers aware of panel radiators? If you're going to sell them a high efficiency boiler and you want them to get that posted efficiency, it's always worth having that conversation and and recognizing what they have. Do you offer an alternative to baseboard? Do they understand the value of low temps, right? Like we talked about earlier. Bringing the sale to the first and second floors of the house of the building. Are they aware that lower water temperatures greatly increase their overall efficiency? These are all important conversation pieces with homeowners. <clears throat> Here are some, some install examples um, where we talked about panel radiators and, and where they get put in. And this application here, you're seeing the piping at, at, at our office building um, with, with panel radiators, and you're seeing the different 19 CV panel radiators and, and two eco style tile bars. Uh, we're running one ECM pump, uh, standard alpha pump, honestly, and uh, you see the picture on the bottom left, but, but home run from manifolds. And this is what the piping looks like uh, in, in the boiler room. Pretty simple application. Uh, very easy. Each each radiator is labeled, uh, so we know which one is which, and uh, and basically they're all their own single home run system back. So it's a very simple system here. Uh, this is a trailer we put together. This shows another home run portion here, but this shows a a vertical narbone or designer radiator, a CV radiator, and then you'll see the magnetic dirt removal there as well. This is in my home, in my room above the garage. This is um, a 24 by 56 Vito fan convector, right? And we're, we're heating a room above the garage, just chic looking. You can get 37,000 BTUs out of this piece on boost. Uh, quick heat up times, great for me when I'm not using the garage, I keep it quiet uh, and, and keep the temperature turned down. And when I am, I go in there and I turn it up and I get a really quick turnaround time and heat up time in that room. So really kind of a nice looking product and uh, and uh, and I really enjoy the comfort of the product as well. This is um, a new construction home that that uh, we had worked with a contractor on as well. Um, manifold piping through. This is a combination of radiant floor warming and panel radiator heat is what you have here. And um, so he's using the radiant to floor warm because he likes that feel and he's using the panel radiators to pick up the rest of the slack in the system. And so you'll see here that you have uh, a setup where your panel radiators are underneath the windows in this application. Um, he has them all through the house. So a nice home, very good looking situation. This here is another application where you'll see uh, a mix of radiant and low temp as well. Some floor warming going on here, along with panel radiators uh, to the left and right of the door, which gives a nice, nice heat output also and uh and again a flow warming application you can also see that there's a ductless mini split up there on top and this is kind of mixing all these systems to maximize your efficiency so it looks like we've pretty much finished up here and we did so pretty close to that hour time frame and i just want to thank everybody that that's going to watch this and that is watching it and i really hope it was worth your time and and then if you have any questions i really would appreciate you reaching out and so we can answer them uh, it was a lot to go over in an hour, a lot of information. If you want a copy of the PowerPoint or something along those lines, please just feel free to reach out. Uh, again, Evan Levesque uh, with Dan Davis Sales. You can reach me at evan at dandavissales.com by email. You can reach out to our office 
as well at 1-800-410-8700 to get a hold of me or someone here to help you with any questions. Please feel free to reach out and I hope you enjoyed it. And, and uh, thanks for being part of the Eastern Energy Expo um, virtual trade show. Thanks.